Okay, good morning. Are there any questions? I have a few announcements. Um, on March 13th, there is the next class, next Tuesday. I won't be in because I have to go to a meeting in California, and so there will be no class on that day. I have not been able to find a substitute. Okay, so that's uh, probably a good news for you. Uh, the next, next Tuesday. Yes, uh, I don't have that ready yet, but I'm, I've started working on it. I'm halfway through, so I should finish by sometime tomorrow afternoon. So by four o'clock tomorrow, you can expect the marks to be put on Moodle. And you can pick up the exams after I come back. That will be next Thursday. But you will know where the standing is as of uh, tomorrow. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all right. Um, so just to recap, no class on Tuesday. And the midterm should be up. Uh, the marks should be up on Moodle by uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow afternoon by four o'clock or so. Okay, and um, <clears throat> thank you for all those who filled all the online survey. I'd just like to share the results with you and talk to you about some of the things that concern me a little bit. Uh, this is an online uh, survey, midterm survey that I did uh, through Moodle, and these are the summary. Okay, so uh, I guess the first question about the electronic technology, I think I'm quite happy. Everybody likes that. Uh, the thing that wor worried me most is this question. The lectures are clear and the pace is correct. There is a wide distribution. And what that means to me is there are sections of the class that I'm not reaching out to. Okay, and that worries me. Okay, so uh, obviously there are people who find the pace is right, and this is, this will always happen. But we need to address that. Uh, and this will happen in the sense there is a distribution of uh, your background. Some are naturally adept with uh, MATLAB and programming, and some are not. But the question that we need to address is what can I do to make you get over that? Okay, so you need to tell me in uh, what additional tools you want, okay, uh, additional help you want. And if I'm going fast in the class, if the pace is fast, just slow me down. Asking questions is a good way of slowing me down, asking me to explain. Even if you cannot articulate a particular question, don't worry about it. Just say, Kumar, I don't understand this. Can you repeat it? Okay, that's good enough for me to get the hint and slow down and try to approach the explanation in a slightly different way. Okay, so that, that certainly uh, worried me a bit. Um, and then the other one, um, these are just uh, feedback I'm gathering to see how effective the use of technology in the classroom is. Uh, how do you like not taking the notes in the class in detail because you're getting the notes uh, that you can download. And uh, still there are a few that would prefer me to write it on the white blackboard or something. Uh, but it's a small number so that's that's fine. Um, the other one is, this is one of the tougher courses I'm taking currently, and the majority of those respondents seem to agree with that, 13 plus 9, either agree or strongly agree. Is that really true? Is this one of the toughest courses you are taking this term? Is, is the time investment in this course demanding, or are the concepts so difficult? Time, 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 time constraint? It's just different. But how does it compare to 2171? Similar, right? Because this is what you would expect in other courses that are coming up in chemical engineering, I think. If 2171 and this were very similar, then I would expect that it should be similar in terms of the <laughs> difficulty and in, some, in terms of the workload that is expected, I think. So, so the MATLAB is a, always a has always been a problem for some section of the students. Okay, and uh, this has been my experience over the last 10, 15 years that I have used. When I was a student, MATLAB didn't exist. It was created only, I think, in the late 80s or 90s, I think. 
or became popular at the time. So, but it is one of, believe me, I have tried teaching it with Fortran, I have tried teaching it with other languages. Um, computer simulation of chemical processes is there to stay, whether we like it or not, because it makes life easier <laughs> eventually, okay. Um, and I will, I'm going to introduce either today or in the next class, ISIS, uh, which kind of puts all these together and makes it easy for us. And, um, but you know, you need to know how ISIS came about. What are the algorithms that are used inside that? And those are the things that we are learning in this course. So it is a difficult course and I hope you will learn a lot because it is a difficult course. You will put that to it and you will, at the end, you will feel that it was worth it. And that's what is important. And uh, about the homework problems are useful in reinforcing what we cover in the class. It's kind of split, it's all over, I guess. Uh, so is there any comment that you would like to off offer feedback? Do you find <coughs> the homework of course, questions like, do you find the homework long? Some homeworks are longer than the other. Probably this one is one of the longer ones that we have had so far, number four, right? But um, are they reinforcing what we are doing in the class? That is my concern. How many of you, I mean, uh, there's a number here, a number of you feel that it is not. Why? Yeah. Um, it just seems like the stuff that we're doing in class is a lot simpler compared to the homework. So it takes a while to figure out what you're asking. Right, right. Okay. So that idea of reinforcing should mean it is very similar to what we have seen in the class. All right. Yeah, yeah. There I do err on the side of pushing you to think a little bit more creatively. A good example is the two parallel pipeline problem. I've kind of re reused it many times, right? We used it in the quiz, we used it in the exam, we used it in the assignment as well. Right. So, the, and in each one, if you notice carefully, it's not the same. It's not, I'm not checking your ability to kind of remember what we've seen in the class and regurgitate in an exam or a quiz, but think about it. How would you formulate this problem as one equation in one unknown? How would you formulate this problem as three equations in three unknowns in another one? Okay. So that flexibility, if you can get over that generalization and the ability to generalize, then I think you would have really learned a lot. So in that sense, uh, I am pushing you a little bit more. I'm using the simpler concepts uh, in the class because if I take a more difficult problem, we will be spending a lot of time not focusing on the concepts, but working out the algebra. Okay. Whereas if you do it in your own dorm or in your room, the algebra can be worked out in detail. Okay. There I'm assuming that your algebraic manipulation calculus are pretty strong. Um, but it is a useful, important feedback for me. So I will take that into account as I construct uh, future uh, uh, assignments and homeworks. Okay. So I will try to make it, I am trying to make it more relevant, but I am pushing you to think beyond what you're just seeing in the class. Okay. And uh, th that's about it. I think about 24 of 23 of the class responded to it. And uh, of course, you will have it at the end of the course, another uh, official one coming from LSU. It will have a different set of questions, but these questions are for me to kind of uh, take the pulse of the course and uh, the class, uh, how you guys are feeling about it, okay? Thank you for those who responded and it's still open. So those who haven't, uh, feel free to give your opinion. <coughs> Now, let's, uh, are there any questions on any other aspect of the course? If not, let's continue. This course is going to be a bit more challenging in the sense there are a lot of theoretical concepts that we are going to explore in this, in this lecture, particular lecture. Okay. So uh, in the last lecture, we looked at a number of algorithms for finding what I call root finding algorithms, root finding methods. Root is a place where the function is equal to zero. Okay. Given a function f of x, you want to find x where the function is equal to zero. So we progressively increased the, the ability, our ability to develop better and better algorithms, starting from bisection, regular false size, secant, Newton methods. You should in an exam be able to identify the differences between these methods. Okay. And uh, why would one method work better than the other method? What do we mean by convergence? Things like that. And as an application, we applied it to a multi-component flash. And that is the one that I'm also going to take when I do introduce ISIS. 
Okay, uh, it's a very practical, common problem in uh, gas separations in refineries and stuff like that. And towards the end of it, we started talking about fixed point iteration. And I think by the time we started losing steam, so I'm going to repeat some of that um, because it is a very important concept that I want you to get at. Okay, so the idea is called fixed point iteration. It simply means there is a fixed point towards which a sequence of calculations will either converge or away from which it will diverge. So we need to understand uh, the process. So given a problem f of x equal to 0, we can always, always rearrange it into a new problem called x equals g of x, which is equivalent to the original problem. Okay. So in the original problem, and uh, when I say it's like this, it's kind of abstract, but you should keep in mind the problems that we have seen, the flash calculations, the pipeline uh, uh, flow, the stage-wise separation, the Krems uh, Sauder Brown equation. These are all single algebraic equation in a single variable. So they all fall into this category of f of x equal to zero. And what I want is x is equal to r is the root at which f of r is equal to zero. And otherwise, f of x would be a function that I can plot. Okay, but this would be my r, the root. And when I rearrange that equation as x equal to g of x, at the root, what would happen is r will be equal to g of r. Okay, so I'm going to put in a value of x on the right hand side and calculate that function g, and I will always get a value out which would be equivalent to x. So the sequence of iteration is written in this form x k plus 1 equals g of x k, k equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay, and uh, what that means is you pick arbitrarily some guess x0 when k equal to 0, put in x0, and what you're going to calculate will be called x1, and take that x1 and then put it back in here, and you'll get x2, and take that, put it back, you'll get x3. So you generate a sequence of iterations, iterates, trial and error, okay, and this sequence will converge, and when it converges, what happens is whatever you put in is the same that you get out. When you reach that stage, you know that you have converged. Okay, and as I said in the last class, this is commonly used even before mathematicians formally labeled it as fixed point iteration. Chemical engineers have been using it since the 1920s and 30s when they do write down their mass balance, energy balance, and they find it's a very difficult problem. So you make a guess and then predict and guess and predict until you converge. Okay. And we, any questions on this reformulation idea that given f of x equal to 0, you should be in an exam able to reformulate it as x equal to g of x and then generate a few iterations out of that, okay. So in the last class, we also saw this example of a quadratic equation for which we know where the roots are. The roots are at minus 2 and 3 and we can rearrange this in several ways and one of the ways, this is case 1 is we take x equal to square root of uh, uh, x plus 6 and the way that we did that is you separate x square equals x plus 6 take this to the right hand side and then take the square root x plus 6 okay so this becomes your g of x so g of x now is square root of x plus 6 and then you start with a guess of x0 initial guess is 5 Okay, so here I've given you a MATLAB script or a function that calculates this iterative sequences starting with x0 equal to 5. So I put in 5 here and I calculate square root of 5 plus 6 which is square root of 11 and that is going to be equal to x1. Okay, and that turns out to be 3.316. That is the second number. I take that and put it onto the right hand side. So I calculate x2 as square root of 3.316 plus 6, which is square root of 9.316, which turns out to be 3.05. That is the next one. Okay, that's x. Um, so you calculate the subsequent sequences like that, taking the previous value and putting it in there. And when, when I do it 10 times in this particular case, I got the convergence. When I put 3, I get 3 back. Okay, That is the root for this particular case. And we know that that's the root because we started with a well-known problem. Any questions on that? 
Now, the graphical representation of this, the picture is always worth a thousand words. So, if you look at what happens starting at 5, so this is x0 equal to 5, okay, and I take that and I put it into this function. This function is square root of x plus 6. So, that gives me 3.3. So, graphically, that means I'm going to just look at that and read the value. That value is going to be 3.3, what was it? Was 316? 316. Okay. Now, I take 3.316 and put it back and that implies graphically I'm going to take, for example, if I go to y equal to x line along this one, that is the y equal to x line. So, what would be the x value at this point? Come on. <laughs> Do, are you following that? logic of calculation. I started with 5. I put 5 in here. I calculate what is the y value. comes out to be 3.316. So, that point lies on this curve that because this curve is representing square root of x plus 6. Okay? So, that is 3.316. Then I go horizontally to the y equal to x line and I am asking what will be the value of x at this point? x is equal to y because y was 3.316 x should also be equal to 3.316, right? x is measured along the horizontal axis, okay? So, and I want to take that 3.316 and put it back into that equation. Graphically, what that means? That means I'm going to go to the that particular curve and read the value, okay? So, what would this value be? The next one, 3.305 or something like that. If you understood that, you are following the, the path that we are going to take, okay? So, this kind of switching between two curves to solve a particular problem, uh, you will also encounter in other stage-wise design processes, okay? So, then you repeat the process. Take that and read from y equal to x line. So, this one is going to be 3.305 and put that back into the uh, square root of x plus 6 and you will get the next value. 3.052 3. 3. Yeah, 3.05231, I think something like that. Zero five. Oh, 3.05, right. Three, two, one. Thank you. Okay. So this sequence converges to the root. At the root, what do we know? We know that r is equal to g of r. Okay? So that is my root, and this sequence is going to converge to that root eventually. Okay? And what do I notice at that root? I notice that the slope of the function g, okay, let me ask you, what can you say about the slope of the function g at the root? Is it greater than 1, less than 1? It's less than 1 because this slope is equal to 1. y is equal to x, right? That has a slope of 1. So, this intersects it with a slope less than 1. So, in fact, if you calculate, for example, g is equal to square root of x plus 6. So, what would be g prime? Okay. 2 times. Uh, perhaps. 1 over, 1 over, sorry, 1 over 2 times square root of x plus 6 and then put x equal to 3 because that is where the root is and you will get g prime at 3 is equal to 1 over 6 which is less than 1. This is an empirical observation but we are going to generalize this as a proof that whenever g prime is less than 1 that root will be convergent. No matter what the initial guess is around that, it will be attracted to that. And whenever g prime is greater than 1 at the root, at the root, you will have a divergent sequence. The sequence will blow up. It will not be going towards the root. Okay? That's an important concept. So, any questions on that? The slope of the function g must be less than 1 at the root for it to converge. 
And you can use this idea to test whether the Newton method is convergent. Okay. So the next way of rearranging it is to write g of x as 6 divided by x minus 1. The same equation. Okay. We just rearrange it as uh, the equation was x square x square minus x minus 6. Okay, so here now you write it as x times x minus 1 minus 6 equal to 0. So x is equal to 6 divided by x minus 1. It's an another way of rearranging the same equation, but this time g of x has a different form. Okay, now we have to take g prime of that and then evaluate it at the root. And if you do it starting at the same initial guess, what you will find is that it goes to 1.5, 1.2, and then 0.5, and then it goes to the negative side. Okay, so and it ends up going to the other root. It doesn't go to the root at x equal to 3, but it goes to the root at x equal to minus 2. And if you look at graphically that particular sequence of calculations, I'm starting at 5. I calculate the value of g of x using this new value of g. And then I go to the y equal to x line. And then again, read from the curve, go to y equal to x line, read from the curve, go to y equal to x line, read from the curve. So the curve has a discontinuity. Okay. So in this particular case, if you look at the equation, at x equal to 1, you have a divide by 0. So you have a discontinuity in the function. Okay. So this sequence actually jumps across. So here is the discontinuity. Okay. And the function jumps across and then starts going towards the other root. And for this g, if you calculate g prime, it turns out to be minus 3 over 2 for this root at 3, which is greater than 1. That's the reason even if you start very close to 3, 3.0001, this sequence will not converge to that root. It will just blow away from that. Okay? But it will go to the other one. It will always go to the other one. Why? Because g prime at minus 2 is minus 2 over 3, which is less than 1. So what you need is only the absolute value of g prime. Not the sign doesn't matter. The absolute value of g prime must be less than one. Then the method will converge. So in an exam, I could ask you a question where here is a problem. Will it converge? You should be able to apply this idea to say whether that particular root is going to be a convergent root or a divergent root. Okay. Any questions? Now, a third way of rearranging that equation is this one x equal to g of x, but g of x is x square minus 6. Okay. So originally, remember, what we had is x square minus x minus 6 equal to 0. So I'm just taking this to the other side. So x is equal to x square minus 6. Okay. And I'm calling this as my g of x. And then I start with the same initial guess, 5, and I write a small function to generate the sequence. <coughs> and what happens to the sequence this time? It blows up. Okay, it goes to infinity. Okay, so this sequence is not convergent at all. Okay, uh, <clears throat> before I go to the, the reason of course is g prime at 3 is 6, which is greater than 1. Okay, let me give you an example, another example, and ask you to think about how you would rearrange it as x equal to g of x. Okay, so here I have um, x squared plus e to the power minus x times sine 2x equal to 0. How would you rearrange that into the form x equal to g of x? x square plus e to the power minus x multiplied by sine 2x equal to 0. That is my f of x. If I give this in an exam, there is no unique answer. So I have to check every every idea that comes from you is correct or not. So there is no right answer for this one. That's one way. So you move this to the other side and write it as uh, minus e to the minus x sine to x square root. Okay, and this would be your g of x. Now that's going to be a problem because. You where x would have to be a negative value. Yeah, it, it will restrict only certain ranges of x because the sine function is going to go like this, right? 
and that's going to get multiplied by e to the minus x. So it'll actually be an, a decaying sine function like this, maybe. Okay, and whenever the function is positive, you're going to have trouble because it is square root of a negative number, imaginary number. But whenever the function is negative, you will have a correct value, a real value. Okay. Um, is there any other way that you can do? And I said always you can do. Okay. One of the simple ways that you can always do is just add x to both sides. Okay. So in this particular case, all you will say is x is equal to x plus x square plus, uh, times or plus, sorry, plus e to the power minus x sine 2x. So I have added x to both sides and so my g of x in this particular case will be x plus x square plus e to the minus x times sine 2x. So even in those cases where you cannot kind of separate an x out nicely, you can always add an x to both sides and then call that as your g of x. Yeah. No, 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 there is, uh, the, yeah, the, the, there are infinitely many ways of doing that. So, in order to, what you want to do is, that's a good question, you want to achieve a solution to your problem. So, all you need to do is figure out one way of writing it and see whether that way will give you the solution. If it does, you've done the job, okay. So, you don't have to explore. The reason I took all three ways in the previous case, case is because it's a simple one and you could see the differences. In one case it converges, in the other case it converges to a different root, in the third case it blows up. Okay. So what you would do is you would try one, if it blows up you will say okay then I will try to rearrange it in a different way. Okay. So what we have learned is that if the slope of the function g is less than 1 it will converge. But is that a useful result from a practical point of view? A mathematician would love that. Okay. And now I know something about fixed point iteration, I know something about Newton method because if the slope is less than 1, it's going to converge. But you can immediately ask him, how do you calculate the slope? Because you don't know where the root is, right? I gave you an example where we fix the root so that we understand the process. The process is right and there is a general rigorous proof for the process, but it's not a very useful result for a particular case. It's a useful result for pr proving things for classes of algorithms, okay? But for a particular example, you don't know where the root is, so you cannot calculate the slope at the root. Okay, so you just have to try writing one way, do the iteration, if it converges, well, that's, uh, that's fine, okay? Any other questions? Okay, so now the calculus, the theoretical part comes. What we are going to do is, prove in a very general way that what we have learned so far is true, that if the slope is less than 1, it will converge, okay? Uh, let me erase these examples. So the proof goes in the following way. I'm starting point is xi plus 1 equal g of xi. That is my fixed point iteration. And I also know at r, I will get g of, g of r will give me r back at the root the transformation is g of r is equal to r, okay? So these are the two starting points. Starting point first is the first equation is the way to generate the sequence and the second equation is when it converged, I will know that when I put r, I'll get g of r, I'll get r back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract one from the other. I'm going to subtract equation 1 minus equation 2. Fairly easy to do. So it's going to be xi plus 1 minus r on the left hand side is equal to g of xi minus g of r on the right hand side, okay? And then I'm going to divide and multiply by xi minus r. I can do that without changing the equation. I'm going to divide and multiply by xi minus 1 r. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to give this term a particular meaning. What meaning can I give to that? r is the root, xi is some guess. So the difference between them is the error. It tells me how far away I am from R. If I make a guess, if I know where the R is, then the difference is telling me how far away from the root I am. Okay? And if I can make the difference small, if I can shrink it, then my error is zero, I have converged to the root. My guesses is going towards the root. So the interpretation that we give for xi plus 1 
minus r is it is the same as e i plus 1 where v e <coughs> is called the error error at i plus 1th step i plus 1th iteration and similarly on the right hand side we are going to take this and interpret it as the error at the ith step okay remember we are doing iterations every step i equal to 1 2 3 4 etc so what is the error at the first step how is it related to the error at the second step at the next step by this expression and that is the beauty of generalizing the mathematical results because all we have done so far is a few algebraic manipulations and an interpretation we are given it an interpretation that xi minus r is the error and we have an equation that relates the error at the ith step to the error at the i plus one step. Now, what is the meaning for this term? G of xi minus g of r divided by xi minus r. Can anybody think and give me any? It is a kind of a slope, right? Slope of what? Slope of a card connecting the point xi to the point r, okay? And I have that figure in the next. So if I am plotting G on the Y axis and X on the X axis. Okay. So if I have a point XI and this is the point R, the root. Okay. So G of XI minus G of R is this vertical distance. That distance is G of XI minus G of R. And this horizontal distance is? xi minus r. So the division gives you the slope. g of xi minus g of r divided by xi minus r is the slope of the card connecting those two points where this function is g of x. The curve is g of x. Are you following me? Now we have to recall something called the mean value theorem. Do you remember from your calculus? Mean value theorem simply states that the slope of the chord is the same, that is there is a tangent, there is a tangent to the curve with the same slope, okay, somewhere, somewhere between xi and r, that's all we can say, we can always find, if the curve is continuous, we can always find a point psi where the tangent to the curve is parallel to the tangent to the chord. So we can replace that slope expression that we have g of xi minus g of r divided by xi minus r by the tangent to the curve g prime somewhere in that domain. So psi is somewhere in the domain. Okay? And that's not really that important to as long as you are willing to accept that this is the slope. Okay? And we want the slope. Now, now the question is when would the error sequence continue to decrease? I have an error at some step i and I'm multiplying it by a number to produce a new error, EI plus 1. But I want the new error to be always smaller than the old error. So what can you say about this function, G, G prime? Must always be less than 1, right? If you take a number, only when you multiply it by a number less than 1, it's going to continue to decrease. If you multiply it by greater than 1, it's going to increase, okay? So that is what tells us that G prime must be less than 1. If g prime is less than 1, then the error sequence will continue to decrease, so your method will converge. Make sense or not? Absolute silence. <laughs> All right. So, uh, as I teach, I guess I also set the expectations from you, okay? So, if you really are aiming for an A, then you must grasp these things and must be able to use it, okay? So if you're not, then you can afford to forget it and uh, not worry about the proofs and the ideas that are some of the deeper uh, analysis, okay? So what we have learned so far then is if G prime is less than one at the root, the uh, fixed point iteration will converge, okay? Now that itself is a very useful, pardon me? If G prime is less than one? Less than one. G prime is less than 1 and that's what we showed here. The slope slope of the function G prime at the root is less than 1, then the error sequence will decrease continuously, so the method will converge. Okay? 
So the error must decrease with every iteration. Now we are going to apply this to the Newton method to see whether the Newton method will always converge or not. What is the Newton method? We saw in the last, uh, last lecture, the Newton method is given by xi plus 1 equals xi minus f of xi divided by f prime. Okay? We derive that by using a tangent to the curve and asking where does the tangent intersect the x-axis. So we actually applied it to a problem and we are going to apply it to another problem today as well. Okay? So that is the Newton method, but in the Newton method, you can treat the entire right hand side as equal to your g. So you can look at Newton method as a specific form of the fixed point iteration. Okay? So g of x in the Newton method is x minus f of x divided by f prime of x. Remember, as I said, g can be written in many, many different ways. But in Newton method, you're going to write it in one specific way, and that is x minus f of x divided by f prime of x. Okay? So if that is g, then we need to calculate g prime and ask the question, is g prime less than 1 at the root? If it is true, then Newton method is guaranteed to converge. And it turns out that the Newton method is always guaranteed to converge. Okay? Why is that? Okay, if this is g, I take g prime. So when I take g prime, what am I going to get? Derivative of x is 1 minus, this is, you need to use the chain rule. Okay? So it's going to be f prime what, square okay, times f prime times the derivative of the numerator, which is f prime, minus f times f double prime, because the derivative of the denominator. Okay? So that is simply applying the chain rule. I'm calculating what g prime is. Okay? And then simplify that. So take the f prime minus f prime square plus f f double prime divided by f prime square. So this cancels out. And what you end up getting for g prime for the Newton method is f f double prime divided by f prime square. What happens to that as you go towards the root? It goes to zero as I have indicated, right? Which means it's less than one. All we want g prime to be is less than 1. But if we know that it goes to 0, obviously it's less than 1. Why is it 0? That's what I want you to think about and explain to me. I am claiming that g prime is equal to 0 near the root. If you answer that, you are going towards an A. <laughs> Do you understand my question? Here I have I'm shown you that the Newton method, starting from this, g in Newton method can be interpreted like that. So g prime is this. And I'm claiming now g prime goes to zero near the root. And asking you to think why? Why why is this zero near the root? Because the slope is zero or the function is zero. The function is zero at the root. F double prime is not zero. F prime shouldn't be zero. Okay? And so there is an exception there that you need to think about. So if f prime and f double prime are not zero, then f is equal to 0. Remember, the graph of the function is going to look like this. This is f of x. So at the root, f of x is going to be equal to 0. But f prime shouldn't be 0 and f double prime shouldn't be 0. Okay. So as long as you have a simple root, a single root, then the Newton method will converge, is guaranteed to converge. Okay. And that's a very powerful result. Now, of course, it will fail if I have a function that looks like this. Why? Because at that point, f, double, f prime is 0. Okay, so we don't know. We have a 0 by 0. This term becomes 0 by 0. What is its magnitude? We need to figure that out before we can say that it will converge. So at double root, we, we have an exception. But as long as you have a single root, Newton method is guaranteed to converge if you are close enough to the root, if you have a good initial guess. Any questions? Yeah. Why, why? The question is, why does this go to 0 near the root? The reason is, if this is not 0, if this is not 0, f will be going to 0. f at the root is equal to 0. That's how we define a root, right? The function at the root is equal to 0. So f goes to 0 
as x goes towards the root. And that makes this entire thing always multiplied by a small number going towards 0. So that's why it's guaranteed to converge. Okay. The second result that we can get out of this is about the rate of convergence and that is an important concept. The first one is convergence. What do we mean by converge? The sequence should go to a final solution, the root. The second one is how fast does it go? Okay. We have seen that through empirical experiments where we tried it with different examples and I showed you that in Newton method the error goes quadratically. Okay. The proof of that is in the next two lines and it's a very simple proof. Okay. But you need to be able to use Taylor series. To do most of numerical analysis that is contained in Aspen and Isis, all you need to do, know is Taylor series. If you know the Taylor series, you can apply that and develop a lot of the algorithms that have gone into Aspen and Isis. Okay. So here I take the function g which I know and I do a Taylor series expansion on that. So g of xn is around the root. How many of you remember Taylor series? No? That, that's too sad. You should, you should not forget it until you graduate because you will need it in many other courses. When you, particularly when you do process control, you're going to be needing that because you will do this process of linearization very often in process control. Okay? Uh, g of xn, the Taylor series simply says is equal to g of r plus g prime of r times xn minus r plus g double prime times xn minus r squared, etc. The basic idea geometrically of Taylor series is what? If this is g of x, if this is some function, and if this is r, you want to be able to calculate that function around this reference point r as you go far away from it. So you can take a point x n. Okay. So you want to predict what will be the function at this point if I know the function at the root r and I know all its derivatives, the first derivative, the second derivative, etc. So it's simply the function value plus the slope times the displacement, how far you are away from the reference point, plus the curvature, the second derivative, the curvature times the displacement square, etc. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so that is Taylor series. You need to just simply recall. I don't expect you to remember it in an exam. So I will give it to you as a formula sheet. You should be able to apply that. Okay. So in this particular case, what I'm going to do is what is g of xn from the definition? Remember, xn plus 1 is equal to g of xn. Right. So I can take this g of xn and replace it by xn plus 1. They are the same. Okay. Similarly, on the right hand side, I can take g of r and replace it with oops, I wanted to change the color. G of r, replace it with r. Okay. They are the same. Okay. And then I have g prime. What do I know about g prime? G prime is here. What do I know about g prime for the Newton method? At the root, it is zero. We just showed that, right? At the root, g prime goes to 0. <coughs> so g prime at r is going to be equal to 0. That term drops out. So the next term is g double prime times xn minus r squared. But xn minus r is interpreted as an error. Okay? So it is en squared. Okay? So take this to the left hand side and write it as xn plus 1 minus r is equal to g double prime times e n square. Okay? So that left hand side is interpreted as the error in the n plus 1 step. So what is the error in the n step? How is it related to the error in the n plus 1 step? In Newton method, this is the key result. It is related quadratically. Okay? So the error goes as quadratic. So if I have 0 0.001 as the error at some iteration level, the next Newton iteration should make it as 0 0.00001 quadratically, just squares that. That's what we call quadratic convergence. So Newton method is really very fast in converging. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on that? How many of you feel that it's you haven't understood anything in this lecture? <laughs> That's good. That's good. I don't know. When I ask these questions, you are quiet, but I'm interpreting that as good. <laughs> but when I do the survey, I, I get the feeling that maybe I have lost 
uh, not half, at least one third of the class, and that worries me. Okay, so what do we need to know from this lecture so far? We need to know what a fixed point iteration is, and how do I rewrite an equation into a fixed point form, x equal to g of x, and there is no unique way for that. And then when does a fixed point iteration converge? When the slope of g is less than 1, and the Newton method is guaranteed to converge in the, in the spirit of the fixed point iteration, and its convergence rate is quadratic. These are the key points that we should be able to uh, take home from this. So, in the last lecture, I already introduced you the generalization of the Newton method for multivariate cases. And that is, multivariate case simply means I have more than one equation in one unknown. I have two equations and two unknowns, or three equations and three unknowns. And Aspen Heises, they all routinely handle such problems, and uh, so does FSAW. So, if you have two equations in two unknowns, I showed you that you can write this in vector form f of x equal to 0, an underscore meaning a vector. And the Newton method is simply x at n plus 1 is equal to x at n minus j inverse f. And we introduce this j as a Jacobian okay, matrix. So, for two equations, you will have a 2 by 2, by two matrix. For three equations, you will have 3 by 3 matrix, etc. Today, we are going to apply this to a particular reactor sequence problem. Okay. <coughs> but how did we get this formula? Okay. And again, as I said, all you need is Taylor series, but this time it's a multivariate Taylor series. Okay. Because you have two functions, each function must be expanded in a Taylor series. So, f1 expanded around both x1 and x2. Okay. And delta 1 and delta 2 are the departures, the difference from the reference point. And that is given the Taylor series simply gives you by f1 at the reference point plus df1 dx1 at the reference point multiplied by the displacement in the first direction and the derivative of f1 with respect to x2 again evaluated at the reference point multiplied by the displacement in the x2 direction. So the picture that you should have in your mind is this mountain that there are two directions land latitude and longitude those are x1 and x2. So there are displacement in both directions that you can make by taking a step and when you do that the elevation changes and that rate of change of elevation depends on the slope how fast the mountain how steep the mountain is so those are contained in this derivative dfx df dx1 df1 dx2 etc okay and you do exactly the same thing for the second equation in terms of both variables okay because each equation contains both variables okay so you take f2 and expand it in terms of df2 dx1 df2 dx2 but the displacement is basically the same, delta 1 and delta 2. So the Newton method basically allows you to calculate this displacement. What should be the displacement so that you get to the zero? Okay. So in the one-dimensional case, we thought of it as an approximation to the curve by a straight line. Okay. Oops. So in the one-dimensional case, f of x versus x, you have a curve like this and if you make a guess, you take the tangent at that point and ask the question where does the tangent intersect. That's the one-dimensional Newton method. The two-dimensional case, it is like approximating the curve by a plane, a surface by a plane. So if you have two planes that are intersecting, you're going to get a line. And you're going to ask where does that line intersect the xy plane and that is basically what this method does. So we know at the root, we want this to be equal to 0, okay? Uh, sorry, the other one, my apologies. We want these two planes to intersect the xy plane at 0. So we want this to be equal to 0. And that is equivalent to, in the one-dimensional case, taking this line and making the function equal to 0. And this is your displacement delta in the one-dimensional case. In the two-dimensional case, you will have delta 1 and delta 2, okay? So these two equations are then simply treated as two equations in two unknowns, delta 1 and delta 2, or the displacements. And you have j11, which is your partial derivative, j12, which is this partial derivative, etc. Okay. And you put that in a vector matrix form, and then you get a system of algebraic equations that you need to write. Okay. So, this delta is your displacement in 
each one of the directions. Now we can generalize this to multi dimensions, whether you have 10 equations or 20 equations, the same idea will apply and the Newton method will simply become x k plus 1 equals x k plus delta, the displacement in each one of those directions, but the delta are applied, uh, solved by calculating the Jacobian and the function. So, Aspen, Heises, all of them use these algorithms and we are going to apply this to an example. So, this one, everybody must be able to do problems like this if you want to pass this course. Okay? So, if you don't understand how Newton method is derived, that's fine. Okay? But you need to know up to how to apply it in your assignment. One of the assignments will be on this. Okay? And in an exam, you should be able to, in an exam, you should be able to assemble the matrix J and the vector for me. I'll give you a problem and say this is a pipeline network problem and is it linear or nonlinear? If it is nonlinear, use the Newton method. That means you need to be able to take all the partial derivatives and assemble it in an exam uh, question. Okay, so the problem in this particular case is you have a reactor series. Okay, so you have a particular chemical that is coming in with the composition of A0, the inlet composition, and F is your feed rate. Okay, I'm going to describe the problem. And we'll write the mass balance and we'll see, do a degree of freedom analysis and identify whether it's linear or nonlinear, etc. Okay. And it's a very common uh, situation that you will find in chemical industries. Okay. So you have reactor one, two, three, etc., up to n reactors. Each reactor is a well mixed reactor. I have a stirrer that mixes the composition very well so that whether I take the composition from one point or another point, it's going to be the same composition. It's a well mixed reactor. So the composition that is coming out of reactor 1 is going to be called A1. And it will be A1 whether you sample it here, here or here. Then it goes to the next reactor, okay, A2, A3, etc. So this is a general reactor that I have indicated with I, subscript I. Okay? So which takes in AI minus 1 as input and sends out AI as output. And there is a chemical reaction taking place in that reactor. And that's what is responsible for changing the composition from AI minus 1 to AI. Okay? And the very last reactor uh, has a n as its exit composition. And each reactor has a volume V that I know. Okay? And each reactor, there is a reaction that is taking place. And the reaction rate, rate of reaction is equal to K V A square. K is called the reaction rate. Okay, so the reaction rate expression is given by K times V times A square. That is how fast a particular chemical is disappearing to form a new product. Okay, so that expression comes from experiments typically, uh, knowing something about the reaction. For example, if you have ethylene, ethylene converts into polyethylene in a polymerization reactor. So A would be the composition of the ethylene and this would be the rate at which ethylene is being converted into polyethylene. So there is a simple rate expression for that. So the mass balance equation is going to be rate of accumulation equals, please, if this is not clear, you have to stop me and make sure that you understand it because this is what the core of the course is about. How do you build models? How do you solve models? Okay. An extra bonus is we understand how actually these algorithms are developed. Okay. But this you must know. So rate of accumulation equals rate in minus rate out plus rate of generation. This is 2171 material that you have seen. Okay. So it is, I have to tell you that it is operating under steady state. Okay. So there is no change in reaction composition with respect to time. Okay. And this, the entire sequence is operating under steady state. Now you can develop a corresponding dynamic model. If you're starting up the reaction, initially feeding the reactor and starting it up, then you will get into dynamic uh, modeling of the same thing. So under this uh, for this particular case, it is under operating under steady state. So there is no accumulation. This is equal to zero. Okay, rate at which that particular species coming into the reactor. So I'm going to take this reactor as my control volume. So the rate at which it comes in and the rate at which it goes out, and the rate at which it disappears. I need to write an expression for each one of them. Okay. So F times AI minus 1 is the rate at which ethylene, for example, is coming into that ith reactor. F is the flow rate and A is the composition. So if you look at uh, F 
will have the units of so many, for example, meter cube per second, flow rate. So many meter cube per second of the feed is coming and it is taking a composition of so many moles per meter cube. Okay, so many moles per meter cube coming in and multiplied by meter cube per second. So I know so many moles per second are coming into that reactor. Minus what leaves, which is F times AI. Minus what has disappeared from that reactor into a product. And that is given by K times V times AI squared. And this is valid for every one of the stage, I equal to 1 to N. So I have N equations I have written down. Any questions on this particular stage? Yeah. That, that is because it's a, I'm tracking the reactant which disappears. If I'm tracking a product, then it will be the formation, the generation. Then this term would be plus. That's a very good question. So the rate of generation or rate of destruction. Okay. So it depends on which species I'm following. So in this particular case, some, some amount comes in and certain amount has reacted to a product and I'm keeping track of what is the reactant. So this is a minus. Okay. Does everybody understand that? This is, as I said, 2171 material. Okay. So we have n, n equations that we can write for each stage. Is this a linear or nonlinear equation? Before you answer the question, you should probably ask for a clarification. What are you specifying? What am I solving for? Right? You should know what you are solving for before you can answer that question. Okay? Okay, then we will we'll defer the answer to that question and ask how many equations do I have and how many unknowns do I have? Okay? <clears throat> so I, I guess even before I do that, I have given you a new variable beta, which is defined as k times v over f. Okay? So what I've done is I've taken this equation divided everything by f, okay, f a i minus 1 over f minus f a i over f minus k v a i square over f because feed rate cannot be 0 so I can just use that as a scale to divide everything by this. So I cancel the f and this group is the only thing I need to worry about. Of course I need to know what k is individually, I need to know what v is individually and f. but that's the only group that appears in this equation if I rearrange that equation. Beta times a i square plus a i minus a i minus 1 equal to 0. So in this equation I can count how many variables, how many symbols do I have. Okay. So obviously I have from a 0, a 1 all the way up to a n. That gives me n plus 1 symbols plus I have beta. So I have n plus 2 symbols in that equation but I have only n equations. So the degree of freedom is? Two. That means you can choose any of these two variables to anything that you want. Then you will have n equations in n unknowns that you can solve. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you that as a designer, I'm interested in specifying what A0 is and what AN is. That is, I know what is the feed composition that is coming in and I want to make sure that the exit composition, the conversion is specified. Okay, so I want to achieve a certain degree of conversion in this reactor sequence. So I give you A0 and I give you a n. Now I can ask the question. Given these two, I have identified my unknown vector x would consist of what then? Consist of a1, a2 all the way up to a n is already specified. The exit composition I've said I want a certain number. I'm specifying the inlet composition and the exit composition. There are many possibilities, okay? but in this first case I'm going to examine, it will stop at a n minus 1 and then I will have beta as an unknown. Okay? So I'll have n unknowns and these are the n unknowns. I have n equations. Now I can ask the question, is it linear or nonlinear? Where are the nonlinearities if it is nonlinear? Beta times a i square. There the square is a nonlinear term, right? And beta product. So both are nonlinear terms. Okay. How can I make this into a linear problem? Suppose the rate of reaction is not given by k times v times a square. Have you done physical chemistry? Are you doing? Do you know what a rate of reaction is? First order, second order reactions? 
Okay. So if it is AI squared, that simply means that it is a second order reaction. So if it is a first order reaction, then you will end up with a linear term. And if I tell you the volume of every one of those reactors and ask you to calculate what the exit composition is, these are the kind of things I will switch on you in homeworks or in exams. And I expect you to be able to handle it. So here is the model. If I tell you A0 and AN, it is a nonlinear problem because the volume is not known. So beta is not known. Okay? But if I tell you the volume and I tell you the beta, the flow rate and the rate constant, so if I tell you all these three numbers, beta becomes a known. Then you know that you have 10 reactors, each with a certain volume. If you put certain composition, you, you have to predict what the outlet composition is. You cannot fix it. So one is a performance analysis problem. The other one is a design problem. Okay. So what is this problem? What would you call this problem where beta is unknown? It would be called the design problem. Why? Because I want to achieve a particular design target. I want to take this composition A0 and produce the outlet composition AN and I want to design the size of the reactor that will do that. Okay. And that's why I, this would be called a design problem. Whereas if I make beta as a known, then I know all, I have designed it. I know what the volumes are. Then I need to predict what would be the conversion. I need to predict what A n is. So I could replace this last element beta with A n. Then it will become a uh, performance analysis problem. And depending on the order of the reaction, it could be made into a linear problem or it could be made into a nonlinear problem. Any questions on that? As I have said many times before, there are a number of such examples in the text, okay, and you should be familiarizing yourself with all those. Okay, we already talked about this. So in this particular case, we are going to fix the inlet and the outlet composition. So we are going to define the vector x as consisting of a1 to a n minus 1 and beta. Questions, is it steady or unsteady? I have already told you that it is steady. Is it lumped or distributed? Lumped. Is it linear or nonlinear? It's not nonlinear. So a steady lumped nonlinear model will give rise to an equation of this form f of x equal to zero. X is your vector in this case with n unknowns. And we have f n functions. Okay? So your job is to find those compositions a1 to a n minus one and in particular beta because we want to find the size of the reactor okay, by solving this. So immediately by going through this, you immediately know that you are dealing with a set of nonlinear algebraic equations. So the methods would be F-Sol would be a good tool uh, if you don't want to know any, uh, anything about algorithms, but if you want to know something about algorithms, Newton method. Okay, So I'm going to illustrate how the Newton method would work in this particular case. Any questions? No? Everything is clear? Okay. <clears throat> uh, so far we have deduced that we have to apply the Newton method or F saw. Okay, now let's take Newton method in this particular case. So what do I need to do? And this is something that I would expect you to do in an exam. So given a problem like this, you don't have to write the code. But you need to identify what the Jacobian matrix is, what the functions are. So in this particular case, I, I'm going to have n functions. And those functions are going to be f1 equals beta uh, a1 square plus a1 minus a0 equal to 0. f2 is beta times a2 square plus a2 minus a1 equal to 0, all the way up to fn equals beta a n square plus a n minus a n minus 1 equal to 0. These are the 10 equations you need to write out in detail. Okay, And in MATLAB implementation, in an assignment, you will have to write a function that takes this vector x packed in a particular way. And you should know what way you have organized all the unknown vectors. Then use them to calculate these 10 functions, if you have 10 equations, and send them back to the Newton method. Okay, That's the first part. Okay, So we have assembled all the 10 equations. The next part that we need is the Jacobian matrix for the Newton method. How do we calculate the Jacobian matrix? 
This is what the Jacobian matrix is, df1 with respect to dx1. Now, if you look at the first equation, remember, in this equation, this is known, and in this equation, this is known. Those are known quantities. Those are given specifications. You have to identify what the unknowns are. Okay. So, in the Jacobian, in the first equation is going to be the derivatives of every that function with respect to every variable in the unknown list. So, the very first one will be df1 with respect to dx1. The next one will be df1 with respect to dx2. But what is dx2? <coughs> Remember, x is the vector contains a1, a2, all the way up to an minus 1, right? So, a2, the second variable is a2. If I have to put the list of variables in this direction is going to be a1, a2, a3, etc. And then this is going to be beta. And there will be a n minus 1 here. And in this direction, I'm going to have functions f1, f2, f3, all the way up to fn. Okay, so as I go down the row, I'm changing the function. As I go across the column, I'm changing the variable. And I'm taking the derivative of every one of those functions with respect to every one of those variables. So the first one, df1, dx1, is not going to be 0. I need to calculate that. How about df1 with respect to dx2? It's going to be 0 because a2 does not appear in this equation. So it's going to be 0. a3 does not appear in that equation. a n minus 1 does not appear in that equation. How about a n? I mean, sorry, the, the last x n. That will be there because the last variable is beta and beta appears here. Okay, so I'm going to take, I'm, first I'm trying to identify what are the derivatives that I need to take. Because in most problems, you will find a lot of them are zeros. You just need to know what are the non-zero ones and calculate those derivatives. So any questions? The first first row, those are the only two elements that will be non-zero. I need to find out what they are. I'll do that later on. And you go through this process and you'll find that the structure emerges. The same thing repeats itself. For the second function, here is the second function. It has a1 in it. So I need to take its derivative. And second function has a2 also in it. So I need to take its derivative. But it does not have a3. Okay. And similarly, it does not have a n minus 1, but it has beta in it. So the last one will be non-zero. Okay. Go to the third function, which I haven't written down explicitly. If you want, maybe write it down. F3 will be beta a3 squared plus a3 minus a2 equal to 0. So F3 does not have a1. So that is 0. But F3 has A2 in it, F3 has A3 in it, and then F3 has beta in it. Okay? Do you now see a pattern there? The pattern is all the diagonal elements are going to be non-zero, and one row below that of diagonal element will be non-zero, and then the last column will be non-zero. Yeah? So for like function to A1, do you not Need to put like a minus sign. Do, do I have an error there? No, I don't think so. I'm just wondering. So, what is your question in function so like, 2? For f2 and a1, like, for in function 2, it's like a2 minus a1. Right. So, you wouldn't have to like make it a negative in your matrix? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to show that later on. All I'm showing here is I need to calculate df2 with respect to da2. What is the derivative? I'm going to show you in the next step. Is that what you're asking? You're all jumping ahead? OK, yeah. So just below that, I actually have the derivatives. For example, what is df1 with respect to dx1? That is df1 with respect to da, da1, right? And So that is 2 times xn times x1 plus 1. So the derivative of this function with respect to a1, okay? Maybe I should write it before I put it in the x1 form. So if I take this and write it as df1 with respect to da1, it's going to be 2 beta a1 plus 1, right? Partial derivative of that function with respect to a1. But beta is xn and a1 is x1. That's why I've left it as x1 and xn, okay, and plus 1. And you go and take the derivative for the last one, 
df1 with respect to d beta, that's going to be equal to a1 square. It's a partial derivative, right? So we're taking the derivative with respect to beta. So a1 square will be there, but this doesn't have beta, this doesn't have beta. So those partial derivatives will be zero, okay? So it is simply a1 square, which is x1 square, the first element in that vector, okay? And that's what you need to do for every one of those elements. Go to each equation, take its partial derivative, and you will see again the same structure repeating. Everything below that is minus one. And everything on the diagonal is 2 times x and x1, 2 times x and x2, 2 times x and x3 plus 1, except for the very last one. This follows this pattern. Okay? Once you have assembled this function and the Jacobian, you can go to MATLAB and write that. And that's what you will do in an assignment. But in an exam, you will just stop at this point. Analyze the problem up to this point and get me all the derivatives. Any questions on that? Okay, let's now get into MATLAB. I am kind of speeding up. I sh probably should have written this function in front of you, with, with you, um, but I guess I'm kind of trying to catch up a little bit because I'm a bit behind. So this function is in the book and this function implements the two functions that we need. One is the CSTRF, which calculates all the functions. If you give me the vector x, the vector x contains all these elements, a1, a2, a n minus 1, and beta. And the functions are beta times a i squared plus a i minus a minus 1. So I put the com in the comment I, and indicated what are the input variables x and what is the output variable f. Okay. So it's basically programming those equations. A x n is beta times x1 square, which is a1 square, plus x1 minus a0. Remember, a0 and a n are numbers that are given to us in this particular problem. It's coming in with a concentration of 5 moles per meter cube. And after being converted, it exists with a composition of 0.5 meter cube per second. Ideally, we would like that to be 0. We would like all the reactants to be converted into products. But in this particular case, we are converting it to 0.5, okay? So any question on that function is simply straightforward application of the two, the equations, the 10 equations or the n equations. Okay? The first one, and then the second to n minus one, because they all have the same pattern, and then the last one. The first one and last one are different because they have a0 and a n, okay? So a n is a known number, a0 is a known number. That's why I'm separating them out of the loop other than that, it can handle any number of reactors. Whether you have 10 reactors or 100 reactors, the same set of model will work. Any questions on that function? No? Then the next thing that we are going to do is the Jacobian. Okay, so CSTRJ is the one which takes the same x vector, but calculates all the n by n matrix elements. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not feeling well, so I think I'm going to stop here and we'll continue the MATLAB implementation in the next lecture. <coughs>